Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ, knowing that you love us with an everlasting love, that you've given that love to us, that you've made us complete and perfect, that you're perfecting that love in us. We thank you for all the wonderful truth that you've shown us. We ask that you just would continue to, to open our eyes, our hearts, to guide us into all truth, filtering out that which is foolishness, but sealing to our hearts only that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Before I begin here, I would like to ask everyone, if you would, to please pray for uh, those that you know who are sick. Seems to be a lot of uh, that going around right now including my daughter and uh, Sue. And so I just recently got over, uh, I believe I got over it, uh, uh, congestive uh, cold, con a head cold, sinus cold. And so, but there's a lot of people out there that are suffering right now. But we've been studying together in the first epistle to John, verse by verse. We're in chapter four. Uh, we got down to about verse six. And I've spent uh, the past several days looking at the rest of the chapter of John chapter 4 just to kind of get a feel for what's going on with the rest of chapter 4. So that's where we're at. If you're behind, that's okay. Uh, the Lord has you right where He wants you. Uh, it would be nice if you were uh, up with us, but you'll uh, catch up with us eventually, I suppose. Beloved, verse 7. I want you to take a note, uh, verse 7, beloved, beloved, I say beloved, it's beloved. God loves us. And I don't know how many Christians aren't sure God loves them. We have the Holy Spirit through the author John, the Apostle John, the author of this epistle. The Holy Spirit, God himself telling us, his children that were beloved and uh, I know I'm certain that the temptation there's that the temptation is always there to just read quickly through uh, these verses and not really take time to notice what it was we were reading please dearly beloved please don't don't take that first word for granted or take that first word as just uh, as just well uh, in a way that, that you don't stop it at least give a moment to that verse to understand just what that verse is saying there are, are 21 verses in chapter 4 I believe love is mentioned 28 times there's no real mention of love in the first six verses uh, but now we're beginning in verse 7 and love is mentioned 28 times in 15 verses that's a lot there's a lot of loving going on here and I don't think anywhere else in Scripture uh, is there uh, is love seen to be so condensed as it is right here uh, now, I know I have to be careful when I talk about this subject of love. It's hard to, when, when you have it mentioned 28 times in 15 verses, then uh, you're going to be, I think that's, it's safe to assume at least that the context here is love. And, and we need to think about it and not just gloss over it and bring our own presuppositions to the text, but, but really understand what it is that we're looking at. I mean, I love tacos, okay? And I love horses, and I love a lot of things. But I, I, I think that we need to, to sep make a distinction. We need to separate our human emotions as, as far as what we feel about love, you know, love for one another, and love for our spouse, love for God, love for tacos, love for horses, love for... You know, we love a lot of a lot of stuff. And of course the world does too. And of course our definition of love is, is certainly not the definition that the world is, is typically accustomed to. Uh, 
it's agape. Most people know and they understand at least a little bit about agape love, that it's different from, you know, brotherly love, you know, agape love. It's the, it's, uh, it's the love of, uh, uh, well, it's, there's unmerited favor involved. It's unconditional love. We love unconditionally. And if I said to you, well, uh, I, you folks out there, I, well, I believe that agape love is, is uh, unconditional love, God's unconditional love. Uh, I, would, I would be telling you, I believe I would be telling you the truth. But I think that there's more, more behind the meaning of the word love than just, just to say, well, it's, it's unconditional love. Unconditional love may describe agape, but I don't think agape fully is, I don't think we've explained it fully if we just say it's just unconditional love. First of all, it's unconditional love to his people. God does not love the wicked unconditionally. And I know that's a hard saying to many, but that's that's that is true. And I would suggest, and I'll, I'll make this suggestion. I'll just throw it out there. I believe that that if if we really are to understand love in the sense of agape love, it is we're looking at God's commitment to us. God is fully, absolutely, one hundred percent committed to us. And I believe that's that's what love is. That's beloved. Let us love one another. Okay, for love is of God, and every one that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. Now that's a mouthful. Okay, there in verse seven, it begins with beloved. We're told that God loves us. Let us love one another. That's that's a that's basically a command. For love is of God. It is of God. Love is of God. I mean, I, a person, folks, could launch off into a whole entire sermon on that love being of God. It, God is the source of that love. Nothing else. Nothing else. Okay? And we're talking about a very particular love. And everyone that loveth Okay, is born of God. That's that's you and me. Listen, dearly beloved. If you're born of God, you love. Okay. If you're not born of God, you don't love. You can't love. The text is clearly saying, besides bringing first and foremost to your attention that God loves you, we are to love one another. Because love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God. It comes along with the package, okay? If you were born of God, you do love, okay? And you know God. You know God, okay? You have a, actually have an experiential knowledge of God because you're born of God and you love the brethren. It is a confirmation that you are a child of God. And this is what we're looking at in the seventh verse. Uh, he that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. And I have mentioned, I don't know, a number of times that the Holy Spirit continues to distinguish as we go through these, these verses between the us and the them. Okay? Where Christians get hung up is they read through this and they, and they think that, well, maybe... As a Christian, okay, maybe this applies to me, maybe it doesn't, or maybe this is true of me, or maybe it isn't. Maybe God loves me, maybe he doesn't. Maybe I love you, maybe I love one another, maybe I don't. Well, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. I don't always love. And it could go so far as to being so serious a matter is, is where that we would question whether or not we're born of God. I, maybe I'm born of God, maybe I'm not. You know, I'd love to know that, I'd love to believe that I'm born of God. I, I look at my life, I don't see that I love very much. Okay? And so we're basing that on the question that we're asking is, are we born of God? 
Are we born of God? How can I know that I'm truly born of God? Well, it's the text seems to say that everyone, well, it does say everyone that loveth is born of God. So, you know, if we're born of God, we're going to love. And, and therefore, I don't feel like I love much, very much, so I must not be born of God. And that's, that is not what the text is saying. If you are, the text is simply saying that if you're born of God, you will love, okay? And I, I think that the Holy Spirit, God Almighty, expects us to under, to, to not confuse like with love. Not to, 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 uh, to think of this in terms of, of other, you know, there's a lot of people that we don't like. I mean, can we, can a Christian not like another brother in the Lord and yet still love him? Absolutely. Absolutely he can. Uh, I think oftentimes we, we confuse, this becomes confusing to us because what we do is we re want to read our emotions into this. And I, and I believe it's what we're looking at is, is something more intellectual than emotional. Look, I love horses, and I love tacos, okay? And I love enchiladas, okay? And I can talk a lot about, uh, you know, a good plate of enchiladas and how much that I love, how much I adore enchiladas, especially with red sauce. And that can get quite emotional. I really, and, and I'm not, please don't be con, get confused, because I'm not saying that there's not some, a certain de, uh, degree of emotion attached to this whole idea of God loving us and us loving one another. Of course, that w is going to bring out the emotions in us. But I believe that on the surface level, uh, love is more of an intellectual uh, understanding than it is an emotional one. That's what I'm going to suggest. And the Holy Spirit continues to distinguish between the children of God and, and those who are not children of God. He hasn't departed from that here. Okay? He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In other words, the, if, if you are born of God, you do love God and, and you do know God. That is what the text is going to say. And, and I don't have any problems with that at all. In verse 9, in this was manifested the love of God toward us. Well, here's how God showed that love, okay? Because God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. Okay, so God's, God's people, both the source of that love is God. God's people love both God and one another, okay? Those who are not of God don't know this love. And God's love was shown us through Christ's death in our place. That's how we know. That's how we know. That we might live. That we might live, okay, through Him. Now, if we take the, and look, go back to John, the book of John, first chapter, first three verses. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Verse 3 there, John 1, 3. We're looking at the same author here. All things were made by, that is, through Him. Through Him. Okay? It's the same word, dia in the Greek, through. Same word that we're looking at here. Okay? That we might live through Him. Okay? Through. Now, you, you can translate that several ways. It could be through, it could be because of. But the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life. See? You see? Are, are you getting that? In Him was life. Okay? And the life was the light of men, and it, and, and it goes, and the verse goes on. That we might live through Him. Okay, the very purpose for God sending His Son to die in our place is that we might live through Him. It's it's like God saying, uh, to us, apart from Me, there is no life. 
Uh, I am, I am the life. And uh, I don't want you to live apart from me. God does not, did not want us to live apart from him. He, in fact, he wanted us to, not just not to live apart from him, but he wanted us to actually live, have the quality of life that is associated with all this through him. And that life that we, that we have, that we know, that we love, that we live is Christ. Okay. And, and it's oftentimes we want to supplant that with something else to, to, you know, and it's things that are fulfilling for a short time, but they don't, they, they don't last. Herein, says verse 10, herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us. Okay? God's love was not dependent upon our love for God, which is the primarily, and for the most part, that is the message of modern evangelism today. Okay? The message is, is if you love God, then God will love you. You know, it's, it's a conditional sort of thing. You know, God's not going to love you unless you love God. Now, of course, that, that I don't think many would come right out and say that, even those who actually promote, you know, this whole idea of, of law and works and self. But the idea is, is there. It's insinuated in the language that they speak. Okay, you, you need to accept Christ. And if you don't accept Christ, you won't, you know, you are the one that, that, that d determines your destiny. You're, you know, it's, it's, it is of grace, but, it's, but grace is, is that stuff that comes in alongside your decision that you made and just kind of, you know, helps you across the finish line. And that is not the case at all. God's love was shown through his death in our place. He died in order that we might live. That is his ultimate desire. It's, and, I, and I don't believe he's just talking about living in heaven. I think he's talking about living that quality of Zoe, that quality of eternal life now. That was the purpose that he died in our place, is that we would enjoy and experience all the blessings that we possess, that we own, that we've been given in Christ. And, and in particular, it's it, him being the source of those blessings. But the text clearly says that if we're born of God, we will love God, we will love one another, that this love was manifested through the, His death in our place. It's how we came to understand it. It's how we came to know it. And it wasn't that we loved God, but that He loved us. And so we love Him because He first loved us, and He sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. God is fully satisfied. Fully satisfied with what Christ did on our behalf. God was, he was appeased okay, through the sacrifice of Christ. He sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. What we want to do is we want to somehow become, uh, we, we've convinced ourselves most Christians have, I believe, today that somehow they have to become the propitiation. You know, they have to sat, satisfy God somehow. So that, that God is this, uh, you know, God, he's, he's a God that must be appeased somehow. Uh -huh. You know, that Christ, what he did was not enough. It wasn't a, sufficient. God sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. And then beloved, again, we're called beloved, okay? If God so loved us, and he did, we ought also to love one another. And that sounds like an invite. And believe me, folks, it is not an invite. What, it, what the verse is saying, okay, is that, it, that since God so loved us, it's a first-class condition. If God so loved us, and he does, so since God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. It, it's only follows logically that that we would love one another and that's exactly what the text says that we do now you can argue with god and you can say well i don't i don't really love all that much you know maybe god loves me but i sure don't love god i don't sure don't love others the way that i know god loves them or I, or the way that he loves me i just because i just don't see that i don't see that in my life i think you're mixing 
uh, up confusing like with love is what I think. There's a, folks, there's a lot of people that we don't like. But it doesn't mean that we don't love them. So behind this love is God's desire that we live. It wasn't dependent upon our love for God. We love because God dwells in us. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man has seen God at any time. Stop. No man. No man. Now, this is not the right time to launch off into a video on, on that phrase that no man has seen God at any time. Uh, that can be very confusing to a lot of Christians because surely, uh, and, you know, for the most part, we all believe that, that, that there has been someone who's seen God at some time. It's hard to believe the Bible if you don't believe that, that, that people have seen God. And, and uh, so as we begin verse 12, no man has seen God at any time, okay? If we love one another, God dwells in us and His love is perfected in us. That may seem like a very tough verse uh, uh, to crack, uh, a tough verse to interpret, a, a tough verse to understand. Uh, I don't see where, with, really how that it, that it is. For verse 12 to begin, no man has seen God at any time. I think we have to keep in mind what Paul says in other epistles, particularly Colossians, Philippians, how that, that Jesus Christ is the exact representation of the Father. Even Jesus himself told, told his disciples, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That all the fullness of the Godhead dwells in him bodily. And I believe that when we get to heaven, we're not going to see some old gray-haired father like God, you know, sitting on the throne with a, a big, bigger, big throne. And then you got a kind of sort of a smaller throne there with, with Christ sitting on it at the father's right hand. And he's, he's, uh, and by the way, that that's not at, at his right hand. That's in his right hand in the Greek. I think we're going to see a God-man sitting on the throne. God is spirit. Okay? Nowhere in the Bible does it ever say that God himself, the Father, that possesses some physical... Uh, that he's, he appears in some physical form of some kind. It's always been the pre-incarnate Christ, the one who spoke the law on Mount Sinai. Okay, the one who guided Israel through the wilderness, the the pre-incarnate Christ. Don't don't make the mistake of believing that Jesus didn't come along until he was born. No man has seen God at any time. If since we love one another is what the text. If we love one another and we do, okay, says the grammar. God dwells in us, and His love is perfected in us. He can't love us anymore. It is perfected in the sense that it's complete, it's perfect. He can't, He could not love us any more than what He already does. If you're expecting God to love you more, give up on that crazy idea because He, he can't. Let that sink in. God can't love you any greater than He already does. There is no, there's no place for God to go with that. Okay, He either loves you or He doesn't. He either loves you fully, completely, or He doesn't. There is no greater love. There's nothing left waiting on the outside there to, to come in and fulfill, complete or fulfill your life as far as love, the love of God is concerned. God's love is so comprehensive so complete so perfect that he, he there's he could not love you any greater than he does 
We love God because God dwells in us. God couldn't love his people any greater. And we believe and we know. We believe and know. We know and believe this love of God experientially. On an experiential level, the text says we do believe and know God's love experientially. And, and, and we're about to see that that, uh, that the love of God eliminates completely, annihilates, eliminates any fear of judgment at all whatsoever. Okay? Uh, we know that we dwell in Him and He in us because He has given us of His Spirit. This is how we know. We, we have we've seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. It is the focus is on Christ. The Father does not glorify Himself. The Father is glorified through the Son. And when it comes to the Holy Spirit, keep in mind, folks, He didn't even reveal His name. The Holy Spirit... And I say this as reverently as I can. His job, his purpose, his mission, his goal, his desire, his will of the Holy Spirit of God is to glorify Christ, not himself. He didn't even tell us his name. You know, we, we have two persons of the Godhead that, that have names. In fact, more than one name, many names. Yet the Holy Spirit... Interestingly enough, doesn't didn't even reveal his name. That's how much we are to understand that our focus is on Christ Jesus, who he is, what he's done in our lives. In uh, that he sent the Son to be the the Savior of the world, the Deliverer of the world. Did he do that? Absolutely did. He's, Christ is not only the, the propitiation for our sins, but also we've seen in the, in, in, previous ver, in the previous verse that He's the propitiation for the sins of the, of the whole world. All of that, trend, that, that, all of that uh, condemnation was removed in Christ. Uh, I've, I've done a number of videos on on how that that and, and you don't hardly hear this taught today, but the world that does not know God. Uh, I, I'm not phrasing this right. Every single individual born into this world was born a sinner. Okay, born of of Adam. All right. Now, they may have been a child of God chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. If they are, they will come to know and understand, be able to discern things They'll, because, they, they, because they are born of God. They're his child. Okay, They will come to believe, receive, re repent, uh, whatever else you want to add, add to that list of, of, of things. But for the non-elect, their transgression had to be removed in the death of Christ. There could not be one sin for which Christ did not pay for. Okay? That would not have worked. It's only later that we come to, to die in our own sins or that we're, we're, held, we're fully accountable then to God. You know, because it was through the disobedience of the one Adam that, that the elect were, were made sinners. And, and likewise, in the same way, it was through the obedience of the one Christ that the elect were made righteous. So the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. And, and there was a deliverance that took place. In, in, in Adam all died, in Christ all were made alive. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, that is, say the same thing that God says, that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him and he in God. Verse 15. 
And we have known and believed, both known and believed, the love that God hath to us. We believe and we know God's love experientially. The love of God eliminates any fear of judgment. We could not love God, folks, unless He first loved us. And, and His love, God's love for us, assures us that we will, we will love the brethren. Okay? And I think it's vitally important that I back up to verse 7 here. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God. That phrase, born of God, you can highlight that in your Bible. That born of God. That is a perfect passive, as we've seen so many others. Perfect passive, perfect tense. Perfect tense describes an action. Something occurred at some time in the past. God was the agent of that, not us. With the effects of what, of what occurred, carrying on into the present. Born of God. Passive voice, you didn't have anything to do with it. Okay? Right there, just those three words. Born of God in verse 7. Okay? Everyone that loveth is born of God. Okay? Highlight it. Okay? Uh, I'm telling you what the text says. Well, I know what modern evangelism says. It says if we do X, Y, and Z, we'll be born of God. Okay? The grammar... In that, in that, of those three words, they're in the original text, the grammar, born of God. It's a perfect passive. It says that you had nothing to do with your new birth. And of course, that makes all the sense in the world. If you're, I, I think if you're willing to just uh, take things at face value and, and understand things from a common sense, in a common sense way, as God would expect us to understand birth, dearly beloved, why did God choose the illustration of birth? Or the, why did he choose birth to illustrate new birth? Why did he even choose that illustration? Why? Because we, we didn't have, that's one thing that we didn't have anything to do with. If you think that you had something to do with you being born of God, then you must likewise carry that same thought over into your earthly relationships uh, with your earthly family, your mother and father, and say that you have to you have to say then the same thing comes is true when it comes to you being born into this world as a human that you had something to do you played some role some part some decision making role in you being born of what parents that you were born of okay now I don't know of very many Christians that would actually do that. But when they come to the Word of God, they find it, some, strangely, they find it easy to do that. Well, we, yeah, we, we were born of God. We decided to be born of God. Just the very sound of it, by its very, in the, just the very sound of that, folks, is, sounds crazy, okay? And yet, this, this is a particular area that our enemy has zeroed in on to try to convince millions upon millions of Christians down through the, the centuries that they had something to do with their new birth. The text is clear. We did not have anything to do with this. We don't love God because it, the text does not say, folks, okay? It does not say. Your Bible does not say that God loves you because you first loved God. It doesn't say that. What it says is just the opposite. We love God because He first loved us. It's, it's, it's the only way that we could possibly love God is because He loved us first. Whosoever, verse 15, shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in Him and He in God. You can't even make an honest confession, say the same thing about Jesus being the Son of God, unless God dwells in you. 
And we have known, we have believed. It's not that we'll, we hope we, we know, we hope we believe. We have known and believed the love that God has through us. God is love. God is love. And we know God's a lot of things. But the text says simply as a matter of fact that God is love. God is, folks, commitment to you. And I, I'm, I'm sure that there's some uh, degree of emotion that we can attach to all this. But folks, if you don't understand that this is an intellectual endeavor or process that we're involved in, and understanding and sorting out the separating truth from error, sound doctrine from, from cleverly devised fables, that if you don't understand that there's, there's an intellectual process that occurs through that, now, of course, there's going to be emotion. Of course, no, no, I don't think any true Christian who really understands how much God loves them, I don't think that there's, there's, surely there's going to be some emotion attached to that. I mean, it'd be odd if, if, if there wasn't. But we're not talking about the love of the world here. We're not talking about love in the sense that we often use and th throw the term around, the word love around. Okay, it's, you know, we love, you know, it's not, it's not like my love for tacos, okay? God doesn't, uh, doesn't love me in the same way that I love a taco. It's like, it's, I'm, I'm really satisfying to God in the sense that I really fill his, fill his belly. I mean, I, I satisfy his appetite. And I'm just, it's one of those things that he's just, he gets a lot of enjoyment out of me and, and satisfaction out of me because I, it's, it, it, helps, it helps satisfy that craving, that longing in God for something that I don't know he feels he needs. That is not love, folks. This is why I would define it as commitment. Agape love is God's commitment to us. And folks, he is, he is so totally and completely committed to you that you don't really have any excuse to, to run around saying that God, oh, well, I'm not sure God loves me. I'm just really not sure because I don't like, there's a lot of people I don't like in my life that he's put in my life and I don't really like him all that much don't confuse like with love and don't believe that this love of God is, is some possession that, that God has given you which is accompanied by some fear of judgment you need to understand God's love for you assures you that you will love the brother because he abides in you. You cannot possibly abide in him and not love the brethren. Well, Steve, I don't love the brethren very much. Now, I think there's brothers and sisters you don't like. But I do think that uh, your new man, that's all that your new man can do. Okay? Uh And we know that love is a characteristic of the fruit of the Spirit. It's one of the characteristics, you know, the, the three greatest, or the three, the top three, you know, faith, hope, love, the greatest of these is love. You know, just about every Christian understands that. Faith, hope, love, the greatest of these things is love. It is a characteristic, it is, it is absolutely the characteristic of the fruit of the Spirit, Okay. And, and you don't produce the fruit of the Spirit in your life. That's why it's fruit of the Spirit. It's not fruit of Steve, okay? Or, or fruit of, I don't know, I, I, don't, I don't want to mention names. Fruit of, fruit of Johnny, fruit of David, through, fruit of Sally, fruit of, you know, it's fruit of the Spirit, all right? You didn't produce it. He's the vine, we're the branches, and love is the greatest. Love is the greatest. It's, I guess, maybe 
maybe some Christians think it's just a little, uh, I don't know, presumptuous to say that, you know, that we can claim to, to possess such love. You know, the greatest of these, love, that, that we... Do you understand that you always love the brethren? Not sometimes. Please, folks, don't go away from this from this section of scripture. This this astounding condin, condensed section on love here, which I I don't believe that, that I, any nowhere else in scripture have I ever seen love to be as condensed as it is in this particular context. Please don't go away thinking that 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 you just you just that your God's love for you is based upon your love for him. God's love for you is based upon your love for others. God's love for you is is questionable. You know, if you don't love the brother and he that he doesn't love you or that you don't abide in him because you don't love the brother uh, like you should or very much. Please, please folks, stop reading these verses from the perspective of as if God presented the, uh, all of these verses for us to sort through and decide which one of, uh, which one of us Christians kind of qualified to fit the context and, and, and which ones don't. That, that is not, the Holy Spirit is doing nothing but continuing to distinguish between the us and the them. Okay? And uh, so herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. I, I would highlight that, folks. As he is, so are we. What, what is that saying? That it was through his death that we became the righteousness of God in Christ. We have a sinless new nature. We've seen that in, in, the, in the last chapter. Chapter 3, verse 10, verse 9 and 10. The new man cannot sin. That we're as righteous as his son. That we, we stand before God without fault, without spot, without blame. All based upon what? Our own performance? No, but on what Christ did. Perfect love casts out all fear. Our text is telling us that this perfect love casts out fear because fear has torment. He that fears is not made perfect in love. He that fears, okay? Now, your old man can fear God's judgment, okay? Please, please understand you have two natures that are in conflict with one another. Well, Steve, I fear, I fear, I just, I have this fear, you know, of judgment, you know, that falls on, on me at times. It's this dark cloud of impending doom, you know, it seems like it just, you know, I don't know, you know, we, we get involved, folks, in these circumstances where we take our eyes off of Christ and we put our eyes on, on ourself, our sin, our circumstances, what's going on around us. We evaluate our condition and how we stand before God by what's going on through our, in, 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 in our lives, okay? We, bait, we, we make a judgment. We try to make an assessment or, an, or a judgment concerning our life in trying to answer the question of how we stand before God, uh, how our performance is going to, you know, before God. And we do that based upon, we walk by sight, not by faith. We're not really interested in what God has said is true about us. We're really more interested in what we can see externally, what we can see outside. You know, faith is, is, is a, it can be a, a foggy, mysterious reality here, you know, it's, the temptation is to look at our circumstances. Surely we can look at our circumstances and we can see that, well, we're going through a terrible time in our life. And so it's got to be because God is upset with us, mad at us, judging us. He's punishing us. He's disciplining us. There is not a child of God that God doesn't chasten. Chastening has no relationship to sin. Hebrews makes, makes that clear. Makes certain uh, 
wanted God wanted us to know to be certain that he doesn't punish his children because they're bad. God doesn't have anything to do with the old man. We need to get out of that that thinking of we are a single natured individual that can some you know we're just we're just one one natured, okay? Where the, that nature is kind of split between good and evil, and that one nature can either go one way or another. Folks, that is not the way it, it is. That is why we become a new creation in Christ. We have a sinless new man. We have a, a, an old man that can do nothing but sin. But what we do is we focus on that old man more than we do the new man. Behold, all things have become new, and we focus on the old. Okay, constantly, we're, we're just, we're just uh, inclined to do that. What's amazing here is that it's not just that the, in twenty-one verses, or in, in uh, we see love mentioned twenty-eight times in fifteen verses. If we go on into chapter five, we see love continues in the first few verses of chapter five. He's not done, done talking about love, okay? There's so much love going on here that it's hard to, for me to even talk about it. I, I've tried to go through this. I've tried to, to, to make some sort of sense, to see some sort of pattern, to make some sort of sense, to, to glean the truth that's, that's, that's within these verses about the love of God. But folks, I don't know of anyone, including myself or you, that can adequately talk about the love of God in the way that the, the Scriptures can. Okay? We just take the verses at face value. Okay? We love Him because He first loved us. If, if a man say, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. Well, why? Okay, because he... Because he that loveth not his brother, whom he's seen, how can he love God whom he's not seen? Folks, you're either going to be in Christ or in Adam. Okay? One or the other. I mean, a person is going to, to either be a child of God or not be a child of God. If, if you are not a child of God, none of this makes any sense to you at all, whatsoever. None. None of it. Okay? The tragedy is oftentimes is that the Christian, the one who to, to whom these verses apply, reads down through these, these paragraphs, these verses, these passages, and they come away thinking a little different than what that non believer would would think if he were to read the verses. Dearly beloved, do you know how much you've been loved? This is the commandment that we have from him, that, that he who loveth God, love his brother also. That was a command. God fulfilled that command. Okay? You cannot love God and not love your brother. Okay? You just can't. There's no conditions here in this section, this portion of John, all right, for you to meet. Okay? God is clearly spelling out, laying out, exactly who you are if you are his child then you you began uh your journey this this journey through life you began and i could there's there could be so much said about that that, that the pace of that journey the extent of that journey the difficulties along the the you know, that trail ride of, you know, through life. But if there was if there was anything that I wanted you if there's anything I want you to see from, from what we've looked at here in in the verses seven through twenty one uh, to the end of the chapter is that The Holy Spirit continues to distinguish between those who are His children and those who are not. Okay? There is nothing presented here in this text for you to do in order to become something. Okay? 
And personally, I find it mind-boggling just how much the, the extent, okay, uh, the level, the, the magnitude of the love that God has for us, dearly beloved. It's, it's just almost indescribable. Look, I'm out of time. I'm going to pick up here again when I come back next time. I hope everyone is, 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 uh, is well. Uh, I, I do pray for all of those who are going through difficult circumstances. Please join with me in prayer for those who are having, going through difficult circumstances. I love you all. I truly do. And only because... God loves me. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.